approximately 10% of us keel over and pass away. 90% of us tend to fade away. If you knew you were getting ready to do end-of-life planning for you or a spouse or a parent or, or a loved one, what would you think about with the assets, how they should be titled, what you should do now before they actually pass away? Join us on Consider This Program today. We'll give you some ideas. Well, good morning and welcome back to Consider This Program. I am your host, Joe Clark. And I'm Darren Hardesty. So happy to have you along. Hey, Darren is one of our senior advisors in the Anderson and Fisher's office, primarily every now and then Brownsburg and Lafayette. Happy to have you along. He's in the middle of his CFP study, so very, very proud of him. He is going to be one of those few people that actually gets his CFP done before he's allowed to use the credentials. That's the goal. Um, <laughs> he's got a. He's been in the industry for almost two years, and uh, I am just delighted to see how much he has learned and what he knows. Major part of our planning team and obviously this radio show program. So happy to have you, buddy. We are talking about end-of-life planning. Mm -hmm. a very, very fun conversation. We're doing it here on the Halloween special. Yes. Right? So, you know, I guess it all goes there together. Yep. First thing you want to talk about in end-of-life planning. And I do you want to do you want to say what you think end-of-life planning means? And do you want to give a definition? Well, it's it's uh, it's hard to put a definition on it, but uh, you know, as people Typically, you know, people my age, I'm 36, I'll be 37 uh, here in November, but um, you don't you don't want to think about end-of-life planning. Um, but at the same time, for me, end-of-life planning is making sure I have life insurance for my family, making sure that um, you know, because of our situation that my family is well taken care of and that I have all of my um, ducks in a row, if you will, to make sure that if I pass that the emotional burden is the only burden that is what my family has to go through, not the financial burden that, that could be there if I don't take the right steps. I actually see more people your age <clears throat> planning for this than mine. You know, I'm 54. Mm -hmm. We really don't want to talk about it. Yeah. <clears throat> but you've got three young kids. Yeah. Right? And so you, you know, it it is who takes care of my kids if something happens to me. It's uh, it's those of you who look like me, <laughs> you know, that are 50, 50 to 65 years old or, or older mm -hmm. who really need to get a handle on this. So yeah. one of the questions is assets titling. What what do you do? How do you look at the assets and how do you title them? So every account that you have, uh, depending on if it's an IRA, if it's your 401k, um, typically you're going to have anything that's an individual account that you want to make sure that's titled in your name. Um, your beneficiaries are really important on those accounts to make sure that they pass in the um, that they go the first to those beneficiaries the way that you want it to go. Uh, if you have a brokerage account or a joint brokerage account that's investing or a bank account, um, you can actually title those inside of a trust that you set up where the trust is actually the owner, um, which is, in our opinion, um, from what we've seen, whether you have a large estate or not, uh, having a trust is a great way to make sure that um, everything at your death is taken care of based off of your wishes and your spouse's wishes, if, uh, if, if you will, to make sure that everything goes the way it should. So titling the account is all about who owns the account. Beneficiaries is all about who gets the account when I pass. So we're not attorneys. We don't play one on TV, radio, or any other show, show form. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you to rush out and get a trust. Um, <clears throat> I will tell you I have one, um, and, um, and I, I'm, I'm a fan of them. But you know, my attorneys would tell you that not everyone needs one. So what are what are my choices? You you said, so let's, you, you, you broke it down to the two areas, which I think is good. There's a, how assets are titled during life. Mm -hmm. Why does that matter? Because it's showing ownership. Um, it's showing who, while you're living, is, is in control of that account or who has say in that account. So even though a trust while you're living, if the trust now is- Forget the trust. Let's just talk about, which I got a brokerage account. Okay. Right. Why, why does it matter that it's how it's titled while I'm alive? Well, it's a great question. And uh, off the top of mind, if let's say I have an individual account, mm -hmm. um, a benefit of it just being in my name and not my wife and my name as a joint account mm -hmm. uh, has a lot to do with the cost basis of the account. So, uh, for example, if I have if I'm the sole owner of the account or whatever the asset may be and I pass away, whatever the capital gains growth that ex was inside of that account will disappear at my death and we'll get a full step up in basis for my wife. If we are joint owners, there's only a 50% step up. Uh, so as, as far as it being a joint account, there's saying, hey, yes, we both legally own this account. You are each other's primary <coughs> beneficiary without being a beneficiary by being a joint owner. There's a lot of benefits to having that. Uh, but in terms of taxation, uh, if you have a lot of growth in the account, typically it's, uh, it's not 
too bad to be the sole owner if you pass away and give your spouse a full step up. So there's that small thing where you might not think it matters a whole lot while you're living. It matters a whole lot when you pass away. And, and, and you've learned so much so quickly. It's just, uh, th- this is important to understand guys. It's, it's, um, you know, we don't need to trust anymore because of the pro, the pro rata rule or the portability rule rather. Um, and yet I still have to trust mm-hmm. <clears throat> because if something were to happen where the doctor would say, Joe, you're terminal, Right. I would make sure all of the assets that could get a step up in basis were in my name, yeah. right? And a step up in basis just means that Barb wouldn't have to pay any taxes on any of the other stuff that was there, and, right? And you know that is that is part of the deal. So there there is there is part of that ownership during life though that matters. And um, since this is the Halloween show, mm-hmm. I will tell you a horror story that we have okay. that um, where you need to understand it. And and um, a lady came to went to one of our attorney friends of mine. The attorney couldn't figure out what was wrong, but knew it wasn't quite right. And so he sent her to me. <clears throat> and um, she had a letter from the IRS that said she owed about 270000 in taxes because the deceased husband had day traded, mm-hmm. done very, very well in one year, and didn't pay any taxes. And by April 15th the next year, not only had he lost all of the money, but he was dead. So now you may be saying, well, Joe, that means he has a capital loss in the second year. Capital losses don't work against capital gains from the previous year. Right. He owed two hundred and seventy some thousand dollars in taxes. But I know people who typically day trade typically only have one spouse's name on the account mm-hmm. because it's it's a it's it's a lot like gambling. Kind of like a hobby. <laughs> and um <laughs> and and people still do it. Yeah. Right. You know, so it, it does matter, and you've got to be able to pay attention to that. And we were able, with the help of a good CPA in, uh, in Lafayette uh, and a lot of work, we were able to get the IRS to understand, you know, hey, it wasn't her debt. Yeah. I mean, she really, really didn't have it. So we were able to move from there. Yeah. All right. So you want to get over to beneficiary IRAs and beneficiary checkups. Absolutely. And the new rule or the new law that was passed at the end of 2019, the SECURE Act, um, you know, we're going to have to do a whole show just on all the different acronyms that we have for all the laws that we have passed. But uh, the SECURE Act, it's, uh, it, one of the major changes was that it set up a 10-year rule for beneficiary IRAs where uh, if you're a non-spouse beneficiary, and there's, there's some exceptions as well, special needs exceptions that are in there as well. But if you're a non-spouse beneficiary, um, you have 10 years to empty the account. And what that means, it, it's going to be taxed not at your parents or whoever your parents' rate. Uh, typically, the beneficiary is going to be a, a child of, of the deceased. Um, but it's not going to be taxed at their rate. Even though it was their account, it's going to be taxed at your rate. Well, the way that this all works out is that typically when parents pass, for the you know in general, uh, you're going to be, when your parents pass, you're going to be in some of your highest earning income years. So if you are earning a lot of money on your own, being taxed at a high rate already, now this beneficiary IRA that has to come out in 10 years is going to only get stacked on top of your, your wages and everything that you're already getting taxed on. So um, there is a, there's a fear in the financial community that's paying attention to this, and we're going to start seeing it more and more um, over the next 10 years since the, the law has been passed. But there's a fear about there's the two different types of beneficiaries. They're, one is going to cash it out right away because they either don't know better or they need the money. And they're going to get all of that money added to their tax return in one year and be taxed at a higher rate. And then there's the other beneficiary who doesn't want to spend mom and dad's money, doesn't need mom and dad's money, and they wait 10 years, the market's growing, the account could have doubled by then, and now they're paying taxes on an even higher amount of money on top of everything else. So having a plan in place to make sure that we structure out the distributions for you so that you're not being taxed any higher than what you need to be. And it goes back to an earlier segment when we talked about um, making sure that you're talking to your your financial professional because about tax planning because every year is different. There might be a year where, hey, income's down for whatever reason, don't get a bonus this year. So here's a good year to take out a little bit more and ha- make sure that you're being smart about that. But that is something that is uh, – it's, I don't want to call it scary, but I think there's a lot of people out there that don't realize that that beneficiary, beneficiary IRA that they're holding, that from a, sp- a parent who passed away 2020, 2021, um, what the rules are that are in place. And uh, we've heard stories about CPAs and financial professionals who've said things like you have to take out one-tenth every year. Well, 
as a former math teacher <laughs> and understanding that the, the, the account is growing, one tenth is not going to be the same every year. So um, you really need to make sure that you find a professional uh, that knows these rules. Uh, you sit down with one of them and make sure that you understand what it is that you've gotten yourself into. That's funny. <sighs> Just saying. But, but yeah. it, 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 um, it, very, it is very, very, very accurate. So what should somebody consider? Let's, let's say you're a single child because mm-hmm. that's the easiest one. And you're doing very, very well. And your parents did great putting you through school, but they don't have a lot of money. Mm-hmm. But they do have an, I have an IRA, right, or a 401K or whatever. Sure. <clears throat> One of the things that I have recommended on many occasions is you use that annual exclusion that we talked about earlier in the show. Um, make a gift to mom and dad to pay the taxes to do the Roth conversion. Yep. You will still have to take the money out over 10 years when you receive the money under the current tax code. But at least it's not taxable. Right. And so you have access to the money. You know, other times we'll see people say, well, I'm going to shift it to the the kids or the grant my kids and just skip over me. You know, depending on their age, that may work or you may get caught with kitty tax. Yeah. Right. So you have to be very, very careful. And some of the things that seem really simple on paper are not as simple in reality. Yeah. You know, as you would as you would like to think. But this stuff gets complex. There's a reason I spend six days of my life in a class, you know, where we do nothing but go over these kind of conversations you know, Darren and Aaron and, and Jamie and Dean all have access to that data. I share it. You know, we all work in it as a team complex, if you will, where we do where we do different things. And and Darren, you hit all of that stuff very well. I'm sorry we didn't get to special needs. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that is a it is a very big issue that you need to have planning done for, especially in this world uh, with the new changes, whether and whether special needs exist today or into the future. You need to be prepared for that in case you have somebody that is dependent upon, you know, drugs or something else or autism or, you know, they, they've got, you know, they've got an issue that has to be dealt with financially to be able to protect them. So uh, we're happy to help with that. Go to yourlifeafterwork.com. Get signed up for your next steps meeting. We'll sit down with you and give you some ideas to consider today, things to consider in the future. And if we choose to partner together, what FEG will do for you. Don't forget to go to consider this program anywhere you listen to podcasts. Get signed up for it. Subscribe.